Okay. Can you guys see the uh, main screen here? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, this morning, uh, we're going to start uh, EP conference. So for our new fellows, Tariq and Tulsi, uh, our conference is basically every Monday morning at 7 a.m. And uh, mostly what we do is go over unknown tracings. But this morning, we're going to have just a didactic, a general, very basic talk on arrhythmias um, so that we're all at least starting at the same point. Free to just do that anytime. Okay. So uh, this is uh, one of my old mentors, Dr. Locke, who was the chief at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And he used to say that the EKHG is a useless test in pediatric cardiology, except perhaps in diagnosing WPW. So I'm going to try to dissuade you of this notion tonight morning. So uh, generally speaking, if we're going to divide pediatric arrhythmias into two broad categories, we have the bradycardias, which I sometimes think of as the more boring tach arrhythmias, and then the tachycardias. And amongst the tachycardias, there are two general categories mechanistically that we think about, which are disorders of automaticity and disorders of reentry. There's a third one called triggered automaticity, but for the standpoint of a clinical perspective, I think if you think of arrhythmia as tachycardias as being automatic or re-entrant, it's a, a useful uh, way to think of them. So uh, let's just review again the normal conduction system of the heart. So we start at the top of the heart, there's the SA node, which is near the SVCRA junction. There are a series of fibers that go from the SA node to the AV node, which is uh, near the crux of the heart near the anterior portion of the tricuspid valve. <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, AV node then comes to the uh, bundle of Hiss. And the bundle of Hiss then divides into the right bundle and the left bundle. And there are two portions of the right bundle, anterior and posterior. And then eventually the bundles divide out to the Purkinje fibers, which um, allow for stimulation of the myocardium. So this is, so when we're in sinus rhythm, obviously, the sinus node is controlling the rhythm and going from top to bottom. So let's first start at bradycardias or bradyarrhythmias. And um, whenever I think of arrhythmias in general, when I'm looking at a patient or, or thinking about them, I just sort of in my own mind's eye think of the model of the heart <clears throat> and go from the top of the heart down. And in, in that way, I'm hopefully not missing any um, particular areas of the heart to uh, consider when I'm thinking about differential diagnoses. So when we think about bradycardias and we think about the sinus nodes, sinus nodes function is obviously uh, the most common uh, problem with the sinus nodes. Sometimes people call this exit block, but really what they mean is that the sinus node is not functioning properly. This is a condition that is very rare to be seen in people with structurally normal hearts, except in very old patients who may have had ischemic events but it's commonly seen in palliative congenital heart disease. Um, in the acute phase, after AV canal repair, for reasons nobody seems to understand, we do see a lot of uh, sinus node dysfunction, at least transiently. And patients who have sinus venosis ASD repairs not uncommonly have sinus node dysfunction, which is not surprising since the baffle of a uh, sinus venosis ASD high in the right atrium near to the SVC in the superior portion of the atrial septum, which is pretty much exactly where the sinus node lives. So it wouldn't be shocking that these patients would sometimes develop sinus node dysfunction. And then more chronically, when we think about patients who've had a mustard or Senning repair, old style atrial switch for transposition, and then uh, patients who've had a Fontan. And I would say it's uh, very rare that you see Fontan patients beyond the age of 10 or 15 years of age who do not have some element of sinus node dysfunction, even when they have an extra cardiac Fontan. So just so you understand why it might be that a person with a mustard or a Senning would develop a sinus node dysfunction, 
as you can see in the baffling of the SVC and the IVC, um, you can see that there's a massive number of suture lines that are placed all throughout the atrium. So it would not be surprising that patients who have this type of uh, baffle not only would have um, sinus node dysfunction due to scarification from all of the uh, various scars that are placed in doing this operation, um, but also uh, it's also a nidus for uh, atrial reentry later in life. And in fact, this is an old study from Dr. Connie Hayes and Welton Gersony from the 1980s, but the study has been redone about 40 times already. And, um, and basically what they showed was that greater than 90% of all transposition patients who had undergone a mustard were not in sinus rhythm at follow-up of eight to 13 years. So basically by a decade out from that operation, very few people are in sinus rhythm. This is important when you consider, to, now in the present era, of course, we don't do um, uh, atrial level switches anymore, except of course, in patients who have corrected transposition and whom we might consider doing a double switch operation. And so uh, this is a very serious concern um, and it makes the importance of the SVC baffle being widely patent for eventual pacing very important as well. And this is just an example of a person 13 years after a mustard repair uh, from a halter. And you can see that, uh, you know, just basically having long pauses where you have, um, you're in sinus rhythm, and then you just basically, here's a junctional escape beat no sinus beat, finally there's a sinus beat. So this can be um, a serious issue in these patients. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, similarly Fontan patients also suffer from sinus node dysfunction. And uh, this is an older study, uh, which was largely reflecting lateral tunnel Fontans, uh, but you see here that uh, four to seven years out from Fontan, nearly 50% of these patients had sinus node dysfunction. And this has been, again, studied many, many, many times. Um, and sinus node dysfunction is a very serious problem. Again, it's almost always due to significant degree of scarification around the area of the SA node. Now, when uh, we're getting beyond the area of the SA node and just thinking about a block in general, um, I like to, again, in my mind, think about the heart uh, from the top down. So we already talked about at the level of the sinus node, we have SA nodal block. Um, in regards to conduction between the SA node and the uh, AV node, one can have a uh, first degree block. Um, so you have all of these little bundles like the, um, you know, that can carry the electrical impulse from the SA node to the uh, AV node, which can be disrupted during congenital heart surgery. An example would be say Bachman's bundle. Um, and so in first degree block, we have a long PR interval, but every P wave conducts to the QRS, to the ventricle. Um, and then there are two forms of second degree block, one of which occurs at the level of the AV node and the other, which occurs at the level of the Hisperkinji system. So in Mobitz one or Wenke Bach, uh, typically there is a progressive prolongation in the PR interval until there is drop of conduction. And uh, most of the time, in the majority of patients, Mobitz-1 is occurring, we believe, at the level of the AV node. And in some patients, particularly when they're asleep or patients who have very high vagal tone, Mobitz-1 block is actually a normal finding. It would not be normal in an awake patient who's just sitting there on the table who's not very highly trained. Um, but generally speaking, Mobitz-1 is usually block at the level of the AV node. Mobitz 2 block, however, is another form of second degree heart block where most of the P waves conduct, but then all of a sudden P waves will stop, not con will stop conducting. And generally speaking, this is uh, due to problems at the level of the Hisperkinji system. It's considered a higher grade of block and more dangerous form of block. There is in fact a third type of second degree block, which is uh, sometimes referred to as two to one block. In two to one block, uh, as, it, as you would imagine, every other P wave is conducted um, to the QRS. And uh, generally speaking, two to one block can be either Mobitz one or Mobitz two, meaning that the block can occur either in the AV node or at the bundle of Hiss. Um, but it really cannot be easily determined from ECG unless you were to do an EP study. There are 
interesting ways to figure it out. Most of the time, two to one is due to Mobitz one, but it is not absolutely not a guarantee. It needs to be evaluated. And then finally, in third degree block, uh, none of the atrial impulses are conducted to the ventricle. And uh, as I often say in conference, one of the ways to uh, recognize third degree block is looking at the R to R interval. Uh, generally speaking, people who are in third degree block have very little R to R variability within a short period of time of an EKG or a rhythm strip. So what causes heart block? Well, there are many different causes. Um, there are a lot of infectious causes with the most common being viral myocarditis, uh, Lyme disease, Chagas disease, and then uh, diphtheria in a pre-immunization era. And of course, endocarditis can affect the conduction system. The most common uh, cause though of heart block that we see is either congenital heart block or trauma due to cardiac surgery. And so you always have to keep that in mind. Cardiac surgery is the most common. Um, there are inflammatory causes like rheumatoid arthritis or Guillain-Barre. Uh, certain neuro neurodegenerative conditions like myotonic dystrophy or muscular dystrophy can be associated with heart block. There are infiltrative disorders like amyloidosis, tuberous sclerosis, lymphoma, sarcoid. And then there's lots of pharmacologic causes of block. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants at high dose can cause this. Uh, Antirhythmic agents can always cause block. In fact, that's part of how they work. And so it's one of the reasons why we monitor patients when we start them on arrhythmia medications. Digoxin, when given to at toxic levels, can um, cause heart block. And clonidine can also cause heart block. So we're using that increasingly these days. Uh, but again, remember the most common causes are either congenital or from cardiac surgery trauma. This is an example of a, a seven-year-old with a history of severe cold symptoms, lethargy, dyspnea, and the echo showed severe dysfunction. We see that the atrial rate is about 100 beats per minute, and um, this is uh, an example of someone who could have myocarditis with a uh, block. And uh, this is an example of Wankybach, where the PR interval is lengthening and then dropped. And uh, again, if we see this on a 24 hour monitor, for example, when a patient is sleeping, not terribly bothered by this, but if somebody has this finding at rest awake, if they're not a very highly trained athlete, this would be an abnormal finding. But again, Mobitz one or Wankybach is generally due to conduction problems at the level of the AV node, not at the Hisperkinji system. The treatment for uh, bradycardias is to uh, treat the underlying problem if there is one, but most of them don't have a treatment and other than time. And if a patient were to have a postoperative heart block um, or if it was due to an irreversible cause, then pacemaker implantation is the, uh, the treatment of choice. Uh, now, one question I often ask, and I'll ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Tulsi this question. So Tulsi, if somebody has post-operative heart block, um, let's say they had a VSD closure, and on we now are like say two weeks out and there's still complete heart block, but there is a narrow QRS escape rhythm at a rate of about 70, patient is fine, has a backup pacemaker attached to the uh, temporary wires, but is never pacing and has a good blood pressure, good perfusion. Why? Why do we feel that that patient still needs a pacemaker, even though they appear to be hemodynamically in very good shape? Um, because they're at risk of, um, of sudden cardiac death after uh, surgery. That's correct. Um, the risk, you know, in, in the present era, we would never not pace such a patient. But in the early 1970s, when pacemakers were much larger and carried more risk because of infection and because of just their novelty, it was still possible to perform studies where you would pace patients or not pace patients. And it turns out that the incidence of Stokes-Adams attacks and sudden death was about 50% at one year after uh, after one has had uh, injury to their AV node and conduction system. And so, uh, from congenital heart surgery. Now, I don't really know if in the present era in 2021 with different surgical techniques, which generally are less um, 
injurious to heart muscle, uh, more uh, refined if that is still the case, but nobody wants to do that experiment. And so the bottom line is that most studies have demonstrated that if by eight to 10 days, typically eight days is the line in the sand, eight or nine days, roughly 97 to 99% of patients will not recover conduction. And that would be the point at which we would generally recommend pacemaker implantation. Okay, so let's uh, move on now to tachycardias. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there are disorders of automaticity and disorders of reentry. And that's how one ought to think about these when um, assessing EKGs or rhythm scripts. Just to remind you from uh, physiology, we have calcium channel cells uh, in our heart and uh, they have a, a very high degree of automaticity. And the area in the heart that has the fastest or the most degree of automaticity in most healthy normal patients is the SA node. And the next most uh, automatic area would be the AV node or the level of the bundle of Hiss. And uh, some of the common characteristics of automatic arrhythmias are that they heat up and cool down. This is important because when you're called to assess a tachycardia, you wanna look at the, um, at the heart rate trend in order to see how did this rhythm start at this that you're looking at or being asked to assess. Typically, they do not have an abrupt onset or offset. Very importantly, these arrhythmias cannot be DC cardioverted. In fact, sometimes cardioversion is in fact uh, and the response to cardioversion is in fact a very good diagnostic tool. And so this is one of the reasons why I always say that if a patient is stable and is being cardioverted, it's always very important to run the rhythm strip while the patient is being cardioverted because the response to cardioversion is important. Some automatic arrhythmias will be terminated. I'm sorry, some reentrant arrhythmias will be terminated for two or three beats and then resume and you could be fooled into thinking that the cardioversion was unsuccessful when in fact it did transiently terminate the arrhythmia. And that could be very important in terms of making diagnoses. So again, in a stable patient when cardioverting, it's always useful to run the rhythm strip. And then finally, automatic arrhythmia is a very catecholamine sensitive. So what are some examples of automatic tachycardia as well? The most common of course is sinus tachycardia. It's not really an arrhythmia, but uh, Sinus rhythm are, is basically something that does obviously respond to at elevated adrenergic tone. Ectopic atrial tachycardia, very common automatic arrhythmia we see. Junctional ectopic tachycardia or JET, an arrhythmia that we see in, predominantly in postoperative patients, something we'll discuss later. And then uh, certain forms of ventricular tachycardia as well. The important take home about automatic arrhythmias or really any tachycardia uh, is that in the heart, whatever is fastest is always going to win. And, um, and what that means is that when a person is in an automatic arrhythmia, some area of the myocardium with calcium channel cells is firing at a rate that's faster than the sinus node and controls the rhythm, okay? That could be either the uh, AV node or the bundle of Hiss when someone is having junctional ectopic tachycardia. It could be an area of the ventricular myocardium that has higher degree of automaticity causing ventricular tachycardia, uh, or it could be an ectopic atrial tachycardia. So this is an example of a 14-year-old girl seen by the pediatrician and an irregular heartbeat obtained the EKG, had fainted, uh, but did not have palpitations. The echo demonstrated severely depressed function. We see here that the atrial rate is relatively fast, about 150 to 170 beats per minute. There's intermittent conduction prop block. And this is just an example of ectopic atrial tachycardia in which there is ectopy from a single area of atrial myocardium other than the sinus node. And uh, basically what happens is that uh, that area starts firing at a rate faster than the sinus node. And it is a very common form or cause of tachycardia induced ventricular dysfunction. And um, uh, in fact, the fact that an ectopic atrial tachycardia can cause dysfunction is something that has actually been used by scientists when animal studies are done on heart failure. One of the most common models that are used is placement of a pacemaker in an animal and pacing the atrium at fast rates for 24 hours. You can pretty much routinely 
create a heart failure patient or a subject by doing that. This is another example of an automatic arrhythmia. This is a uh, five month old following a tetralogy of low repair. You can see here, this is an esophageal lead where we see that there are more ventricular electrograms than atrial electrograms and the QRS is the usual QRS. So this is an example of uh, ventriculoatrial dissociation with a junctional acceleration or junctional ectopic tachycardia. <clears throat> This is another example. This is a 15-year-old patient who had a history of so-called Bellhassen's ventricular tachycardia coming from the left ventricular outflow tract. And uh, I asked the patient to do a little bit of exercise in the emergency room. This is going back now over 20 years. And you see that with just a little bit of exercise, when I got the sinus node faster transiently, it extinguished the uh, automatic ventricular tachycardia demonstrating that the rule that whatever is fastest in the heart usually wins. So in this case, by, by elevating the sinus rate transiently, we were able to temporarily block the uh, VT. <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna move on to a reentry. And reentry is very important to understand because it really uh, explains basically uh, 90 to 95% of all SVT in pediatric patients. And in order to understand reentry, you need to understand that there are three main requirements in order to have reentry. The first is, uh, if you look at this cartoon, that you have to have two pathways that are conducted proximally and distally. Second, you have to have unidirectional block in one pathway. And what does that mean? It means that, if both pathways, assume that this area on the left side and the right side are two pathways, if I'm pacing in the atrium up here down to the ventricle, imagine this is the AV node. If I'm pacing and going down two pathways at the same time, there is no way for reentry to occur because both will be depolarized at the same time, meaning both will be refractory. So when this impulse tries to come back up this pathway, it will be refractory. Similarly, an impulse coming down here will be refractory going the other direction. So there needs to be an area of unidirectional block so that only one of the pathways is engaged. And then finally, there needs to be a zone of slow conduction so that by the time the uh, impulse goes down uh, the one pathway, the other pathway is no longer refractory and can conduct in the opposite direction. So for example, if I put a premature atrial contraction in that was uh, too early to go down this pathway, but this pathway could conduct the pathway, then it would go down the pathway. Now, if there was not a zone of slow conduction, it would just come around very rapidly and the other pathway would still be refractory from the prior uh, APC that blocked in the, uh, in the pathway. However, if there were a zone of slow conduction, there would be enough time for the other pathway to no longer be refractory, allowing for reentry. So in order to have reentry, you have to have a lot of things happening all at the same time, <clears throat> which explains why it is that patients with reentry are not in tachycardia continuously. And that is, first of all, of course, you have to have the architecture, which is the two pathways. You have to have unidirectional block, or another way of saying it is that there needs to be a difference in the effective refractory periods of the two pathways. And finally, there needs to be a zone of slow conduction that will allow for reentry to occur because the other pathway will no longer be refractory. So you have to have all those three things happening all at the same time in order to have tachycardia. Some of the general characteristics of reentrant arrhythmias are that they can be initiated and terminated with appropriately timed premature beats. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they have abrupt onset and termination. And um, importantly, they can be successfully terminated, at least temporarily, with DC cardioversion. Again, pointing out why it is important to always run the strip if you can. Obviously, in an emergency, it's a different story. Some of the classic examples of reentrant arrhythmias are accessory pathway or bypass tract mediated tachycardia with the classic one being Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or AVNRT is a reentrant arrhythmia. It's in fact the most common form of SVT in adults, but is also very common in kids. <clears throat> 
uh, atrial flutter or intraatrial reentry, which we see in post-op congenital patients, a very common reentry in arrhythmia. And then some forms of ventricular tachycardia are also reentrant in nature. <clears throat> now we're going to just briefly go over the most common form of reentry, which is accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. It is by far the most common form of tachycardia. It's a little bit more common in males than females. And the typical route is from the atrium to the ventricle via the AV node, and then retrograde up the accessory pathway. And when you have a tachycardia in which you're going down the AV node and up the accessory pathway, we refer to that as orthodromic reentrant tachycardia or ORT. So this is what an ER physician might call SVT, but as cardiologists, we would try to determine if it's ORT. And one of the classic ways that I've always teach fellows, and we all know, is that if the on the electrocardiogram, you're looking for retrograde P waves, if the R to P interval exceeds 70 milliseconds, usually that is consistent with ORT. There are many other diagnoses it could be consistent with, but that is to that is in contradistinction to AVNRT, where the, uh, the R to P interval is usually less than 70 milliseconds. This is an example. If we look on the right-hand side, this is a patient with Epstein's anomaly. I chose this example because the patient had very, very large P waves because of the atrial enlargement seen in Epstein's. So we see these very large P waves, some of which are even taller than the QRS in this patient. And we see in tachycardia, um, that there are retrograde P waves. I think lead two is a very nice lead. We see that in sinus rhythm in lead two, the T wave is largely flat, but in tachycardia, we see this very large P wave that is inflecting on top of the, the T wave. And we can see that the R to P interval is very long. In this case, it's maybe 170 milliseconds. So this is a very nice example of orthodromic reentry. And you remember that patients with Epstein's often have WPW and often have multiple accessory pathways. Again, the uh, RP interval is greater than 70 milliseconds. Now, when we think about ORT or SVT, uh, the, the peak age of occurrence is in the first two months of age. About 40% of first episodes will occur this early in life. And it's very common that we're getting phone calls from the neonatal ICU about patients who are having SVT. Um, the frequency though decreases over the first year of life. And this is very important in terms of natural history that two thirds of infants who have SVT in the newborn period will no longer have clinical tachycardia at a year of age. And a one third, if you were to formally test them, will have no evidence for accessory pathway test by a formal transesophageal testing. So when parents, when you're speaking with the parent of a child with SVT, we would always treat SVT, but we would always hope that there would be a two thirds chance of the patient, shall we say, outgrowing the accessory pathway in tachycardia. And this is one of the reasons why we rarely perform ablations in small children, because we're always hoping that the natural history will be in favor of the child's uh, tachycardia going away. Now, I will say that more recent data has suggested that if you have WPW and SVT, the chances of it going away is a little bit less. It's still 50%, however. And so you would always want to um, if possible, not perform any invasive procedures on these infants, treat medically with the hope and expectation that by year of age, the tachycardia will uh, improve. But it does mean that a third of patients will continue to have tachycardia or have accessory pathway conduction. And so uh, when we say goodbye to these patients after a year or two of age, I always remind the parents to not lose my card because uh, the next most common time that patients start having tachycardia is uh, between the ages of five to eight, but really it's in the adolescent years that we see most of the um, tachycardia recurrences. And so about 30 to 40% of patients with tachycardia as young infants will recur later in life. And so it's important to uh, always remind parents that um, they should take seriously the complaints of their children if they've had SVT in the past. Just to briefly go over WPW, since it's such a, an omnipresent issue that we deal with in pediatric cardiology, uh, 
It's uh, the paradigm of orthodromic reentry tachycardia. It was, it, although it was first described by Wolf Parkinson and White in the 1930s, in truth, if you go back historically, um, there in fact are uh, many descriptions of the WPW going back into the 1800s, just that people didn't really mechanistically understand it. Uh, and in fact, even doctors Wolf Parkinson and White did not mechanistically understand it and was not really understood until the 1950s. But the bottom line is it's characterized by a short PR interval, the appearance of a bundle branch block on the resting surface electrocardiogram and intermittent episodes of SVT. Um, and again, we have the so-called delta wave, which is uh, dem demonstrative of ventricular pre-excitation. And so why is there a delta wave? Because if you look in this little cartoon, if you're in sinus rhythm, the impulse will go down both the AV node and Hispurkinji system, as well as the accessory pathway. And the area of myocardium that is being depolarized by near to the accessory pathway is being pre-excited or excited earlier than it normally would were the signal to be going exclusively through the AV node bundle of Hiss and uh, bundle branches. And so there is truly an area of heart that is being pre-excited, and that's the reason why we use the term pre-excitation. And very importantly, there's a very small but not insignificant risk of sudden cardiac death in WPW. It's estimated at one and a half per 1,000 patient years. This is an example of a 15-year-old boy who had an insignificant past medical history, is seen in the emergency room with palpitations and dizziness. And what we're looking at here, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, a wide QRS tachycardia, and it is irregular, uh, meaning that the R to R interval is varying, and it is irregularly irregular. There is no obvious pattern, but some of these R to R intervals are as short as uh, 300 milliseconds, suggesting, uh, I'm sorry, 200 milliseconds, suggesting a heart rate exceeding 300 beats per minute. So this patient was uh, defibrillated and uh, upon defibrillation was determined to have a Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So what exactly was going on? So in this particular example, the patient was having uh, what we call pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So when people have WPW, for reasons that are not entirely well understood, they are at enhanced risk for AFib. Now, if a person who does not have WPW has atrial fibrillation, the only mechanism or means for the impulse from the atrium to conduct to the ventricle is through the AV node and the bundle of Hiss. And the AV node and the bundle of Hiss really cannot conduct much above 200 beats per minute. So patients who have atrial fibrillation, typically they can tell they're in it because their heart is beating rapidly and irregularly. But as a general rule, in the short term, you do not die from AFib. <clears throat> However, if you have WPW, that means, of course, that you have another mechanism via the accessory pathway for the impulse to be conducted from atrium to ventricle. And um, some accessory pathways can actually conduct better than the AV node Hispurkinji system, not all. So if you have, but if you have a slick accessory pathway that can conduct very rapidly, what was atrial fibrillation can rapidly become ventricular fibrillation. And that is in fact, the reason why we believe the rare patient with WPW dies. But it's important to understand that the reason that most people with WPW do not die. It's because a lot of things have to happen all at the same time badly. First of all, you have to go into AFib, which thankfully, even amongst WPW children, is uncommon. Second of all, you have to have WPW. But third, your pathway has to be a slickly conducting pathway. It has to have a very rapid conduction profile, typically has to be able to conduct at rates above 250 beats per minute in order to uh, allow this very rapid atrial uh, rhythm, which could, be, could exceed 300 beats per minute to go to the ventricle resulting in VF and sudden cardiac death. So importantly, when we think about WPW, the risk for death is not from SVT or ORT, even though those are by far the most common arrhythmias we see. So when someone has WPW, by far the most common thing we see is SVT or ORT. 
But the thing we worry about the most is rapidly conducted AFib, <clears throat> which thankfully is very rare in infants. <clears throat> Digoxin and verapamil are contraindicated in WPW patients because both, both agents can enhance accessory pathway conduction and reduce AV nodal conduction. Now, there are some pediatric cardiologists who feel comfortable putting newborns on digoxin in the setting of WPW on the theory that AFib is so rare in that patient population, it's not necessarily wrong. I don't generally do that because I feel there's enough other agents to choose from, but some people do that. Uh, and if it's done in the first year of life, it's generally most of the time safe. And most important of all is educating parents about tachycardia. Once a patient with WPW has been identified, one has to go through carefully with the patients, the sign, with the family, the signs and symptoms of tachycardia in order to properly identify it in a timely fashion to seek medical attention. Now, this is an example of a 16-year-old who has palpitations and dizziness 10 years after Fontan palliation for tricuspid atresia. And uh, this is kind of a lousy tracing. I don't know why I haven't changed it over the years, but the bottom line is that this is an example of uh, intraatrial reentrant tachycardia. And as I always say, if you ever see a Fontan patient who's a teenager, whose heart rate is above 100, the burden of proof is on you to prove that it is, that it is truly sinus rhythm. I have seen very experienced cardiologists send patients home who were being seen for a routine annual visit and were in atrial flutter and did not recognize it until afterwards. Uh, when we have atrial flutter in a Fontan patient, we refer to it as intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, sometimes referred to as IART. It is a very common problem that affects um, about a quarter of all patients with repaired or palliated congenital heart disease. And probably that percentage rises the older that the patient is. And uh, we, uh, you know, people who take care of adult congenital patients. Uh, are dealing with this problem constantly. And it is a particular problem amongst Fontan patients. There is some literature that is beginning to uh, develop suggesting that extra cardiac Fontan patients may be at lower risk. As you know, one of the theoretical reasons we do extra cardiac Fontans is by not having to put extra suture lines in the atrium. The thought is that they will be less prone both to sinus node dysfunction as well as IART. Um, Given that IART typically presents 10 to 15 years after Fontan, and given that the extracardiac Fontan has only been around for about 10 to 15 years, the jury is still out as to whether that's in fact going to be true. This is a uh, drawing uh, from a diagram from an old paper from 25 years ago from Steve Fishberger. Again, one of these types of studies that has been redone a million times, but all of them look almost identical to this curve. On the y-axis, we see the probability of freedom from atrial flutter. On the x-axis, we see the time since Fontan. And basically what you see is that at Boston Children's Hospital, at 20 years out, virtually everybody had IART. Now, this was in an era when a lot of the patients still had old style RA to PA anastomosis Fontans but I think that probably if you added another 10 years to this chart, it would still look pretty much the same with present day Fontans. And in a uh, patient who has a Fontan, typically the IART circuit is a reentrant loop related to a scar. So just like we talked about with reentry, you have um, two pathways, one on one side of the scar, one on the other you have a difference in uh, effective refractory periods of the two sides, and then you have a zone of slow conduction, which allows for reentry to occur. And I might add that one of the reasons that these are so difficult to ablate is because the uh, scars are always in different locations, depending on which surgeon did the operation and how it was done. Uh, the atrial myocardium in Fontan patients tends to be very scarred and thickened. And so it's very difficult to get a good burn uh, lesion size here. And then because of the size of the atria, uh, sometimes it's difficult to get the catheter on the site. 
And oftentimes one needs to put in many, many RF applications before uh, a line of conduction block is significant enough to terminate and block it. And then finally, as you would imagine, most Fontan patients do not have just one atriotomy scar. They often have atrial septal scars. They have scars in multiple locations in the heart. And there are many naturally occurring anatomical uh, boundaries, such as in this little drawing, the crista terminalis, which can be an area for reentry even in people with structurally normal hearts. So uh, it's not uncommon to have multiple circuits and it can be a very challenging long day in the cath lab when one has to attack one of these. So just to summarize our uh, tachycardia mechanisms and we'll uh, finish up today at this point. Um, again, when I'm thinking about the heart, I'm thinking about, uh, I, I always start at the top and work my way down and I only do that. You can do it any way you want, but it's a, just a mechanism for me to not forget to think about the different areas that could be affecting a tachycardia when I'm trying to come up with a differential diagnosis when I'm first seeing an arrhythmia. So at the level of the SA node, when we think about automatic arrhythmias, really the only one affecting that is, the, is sinus tachycardia, which is not necessarily an arrhythmia, although there is a condition of so-called inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And then um, rarely there are patients who have uh, this rare condition called SA nodal reentry where patients have a normal P wave, but it stops and starts suddenly, <clears throat> and there's truly reentry in the SA node. I've seen this a handful of times. At the level of the atrial muscle, when we're thinking about automatic arrhythmias, we're thinking mostly about ectopic atrial tachycardia, but also a multifocal atrial tach, or what is sometimes referred to as chaotic atrial rhythm. And when we're thinking about reentry, we're talking about atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. At the level of the AV node, when we're considering automatic arrhythmias, we're thinking about a jet or junctional atopic tachycardia. When we're thinking about reentrant arrhythmias, the only arrhythmia that's reentrant at the AV node is uh, AV and RT. Um, there is no automatic AV reciprocating arrhythmia, but certainly we've talked today a little bit about WPW. Um, also, there are patients who have so-called concealed accessory pathways, which are very similar to WPW pathways, except we call them concealed because in sinus rhythm, there's no evidence for them because they only conduct retrograde. They only conduct from the ventricle to the atrium. And because of that, in normal sinus rhythm, we do not actually see evidence for them. And finally, at the level of the ventricles, one can have both automatic or reentrant arrhythmias causing ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation or BT. So I think I'm gonna stop at this point. Uh, it's a lot to digest. Did anybody have any questions on this general uh, discussion of uh, arrhythmias in young people? Just, uh, we got a little silence here. Okay. Well, uh, I think that's enough for today. We'll uh, come back next week and uh, do a little bit more general arrhythmia discussion, and then uh, we'll start doing our interesting unknowns. So uh, thanks for joining today, guys, and uh, just welcome to everybody. I'm really excited. We have wonderful new fellows to join our already wonderful fellows. So I'll see you guys all in a little while at uh, sign out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pass.